drives it to right. This one's on a line to the warning track to the wall. It's gone. Oh, and Robbie Big Fly has number one. A three-run home run for Rob Calabrese. In the season of first, the Wisconsin Rapids Raptors are officially your Northwoods League South Division first half champions. Welcome to Winterfield for Raptors pregame as this is Cooper Perkins welcoming you aboard for the second round of the Northwoods League playoffs as the Raptors will host the Battle Creek Bombers in the South Division title game. I'm joined by Sam Jelinek. Sam, how are you? Another day for another playoff game. Let's get at it. So the Raptors win in spectacular fashion last night. They beat the Lakeshore Chinooks 19-3. A litany of club records fell last night. The most runs scored in a single game, the most runs in an inning, and also the biggest margin of victory. And it just so happened to come in the very first playoff game in franchise history. Isn't it crazy? Seven years leading up to this moment, and the Raptors just come out swinging. Andrew Turner, Rob Calabrese have big days at the plate. Turner with a grand slam, Calabrese with a three-run shot. Everything was clicking for them last night. Not to look past the rest of the lineup, the Raptors as a group, every starter had at least one base hit. Joe Waynehouse also drove in four, three RBI for Richie Palacios. It was a really incredible showing top to bottom. This team went out there and dominated. It was 15-0 to zero at the end of the second inning. Things were over. Yeah, with the roster that Lakeshore had, Wisconsin Rapids knew what they had to do. They knew what kind of pitching they were going to be facing, and they got the job done. And that's that's the mark of very good teams. When they know that they are facing an inferior team, they don't they they don't wait to attack. They get after it early and make sure that there is no question about who the better team is. And Cole Gannett's on the mound was not actually a slouch. You look at the, the roster for Lakeshore, you see they only had 15 players, but Cole Gannett, while he's no Marshall Kozowski, was still a very formidable starter. He was in the Major League Dream Showcase. He had an ERA of about three and a half. He'd been very solid all season. It just wasn't there for him yesterday, though. The Raptors just had quality at bats one through nine in the first inning as they batted around and then some. Just every at bat that the Raptors had, Everybody was making solid contact, working the count, working walks, and just everything was clicking at the most perfect time. Anytime you score nine runs in an inning and send 14 men to the plate, things are going to go really well for a team. That's what the Raptors saw last night. It was over before it even started, and Chris Cooper only had to work three innings. The Raptors pulled him after 52 pitches, which means he might just be available to start one of the Summer Collegiate World Series games should the Raptors win tonight and move on. And an even bigger key from last night's game is that the back end of the bullpen didn't have to be touched at all. That means Blair Laxo, John Jager, and Garrett Schilling are all available for tonight. And should we get to the College World, the uh, Collegiate World Series for that as well. Well, that's a big point that we'll talk more about later in the pregame show. I want to look at last night, though. Battle Creek and Madison was the other game in the South Division. And then in the North, you had Eau Claire versus Mankato and St. Cloud versus Wilmer. Let's look at Battle Creek and Madison first. The Raptors will be playing the Bombers, which means Battle Creek won in Madison at the Duck Pond, a 9-8 barn burner that finished with the Battle Creek Bombers essentially forcing the Mallards to strand the bases loaded. In a season that has been characterized by so many wild fish, uh, finishes at the Duck Pond, it felt like we had one more brewing last night, but the Mallards just didn't quite have enough to get it done. And what a job out of the bullpen for the Bombers by Scott Sensi. The man that we would have expected to start against the Raptors here tonight comes out of the pen, throws, I believe, four or five innings out of the pen, normally a starter, and just shuts down the Mallards for the latter portion of the game. It was absolutely dominant. Cody Puckett, their starter, didn't really have his best stuff. He threw 50-some-odd pitches in two innings. He only gave up two runs, but Battle Creek and Gary McClure weren't feeling it that night. They decided the bullpen was the better route, so Cody Puckett might be available in the next couple of days should Battle Creek move uh, win, win tonight and move on, in which case a, a, a nice a situation for them to have it line up that way. But Scott Sensi, who was slated to be their number two, is unavailable. 84 pitches, which means he too could pitch with just four days of rest. So they have some options in the Summer Collegiate World sh Series should they win tonight. But first, they need to win tonight. Cody Puckett and Scott Sensi both were used last night, so they're hurting a little bit in the arm department. Cooper Marshall actually was injured. Their shortstop uh, in the ninth inning went down. And he will not be here. Uh, also, they hit two more home runs. This is a Battle Creek team that has made a habit of the long ball in the last month or so. 25 home runs in the month of August, which when you compare it to where they were in June and July, is a different planet. Just 23 total between those two months, and all of a sudden they've more than doubled that in August. You could more than say that they have gotten hot at the right time. They've been hitting the long ball with consistency, and it's been how they've in, in how they've been winning ball games, just outscoring opponents, even though the pitching's been solid at times. 
their offensive production is the reason why they're here right now. We'll take more time to talk about Battle Creek at the back end of our pregame show. Let's look at the North Division. Eau Claire versus Mankato. The Express win at 5-1. Caleb Bushley was dominant. He went 8-0 in the regular season, picks up another victory in the postseason, which means no more Jake Shepsky. The league MVP is gone. One less matchup for the Rafters to potentially worry about if they are to make the Summer Collegiate World Series. You can rule Mankato out there. You can rule out their explosive lineup. But now Eau Claire moves on. Good pitching beats good hitting. And that just happens so very often in the postseason. Once you get to the higher levels of postseason play like this, the elite pitching usually tends to, to outpitch the elite hitting. And it's just another case of this. And for Eau Claire, they move on to play another extremely good pitching team. I'm going to give you credit where credit's due on this one. We talked last night before the opening round ball game. We talked about St. Cloud and Wilmer. We talked about good pitching versus good hitting. And you made the case that Nine times out of ten in a playoff situation, it is the good pitching that wins out. And that's exactly what we saw with St. Cloud and Wilmer. It was only a two-hour and ten-minute game. The Rocks won it two to one. They were dominant. Wilmer really had nothing going, and that's a team that's hit well all season long. So your matchup now is St. Cloud and uh, rather St. Cloud and Eau Claire, a couple of teams who are extraordinarily even. We'll talk about them after the commercial break, but we're going to take a quick timeout as you're listening to Raptors pregame on WFHR 1320 AM, WFHR.com, and the TuneIn Radio app. Welcome back to a special playoff edition of Raptors pregame. You're listening on WFHR 1320 AM. The Raptors and the Bombers tonight as they will meet in the South Division title game. But let's continue on with the North right where we were before the commercial break. St. Cloud and Eau Claire is the matchup on the other side. So we're into our semifinals now. We'll know who's in the Summer Collegiate World Series after tonight is over. It might be the Raptors, it might not. But on the other side, it will be either the Rocks or the Express. The two half winners, the Express in the first half, the Rocks in the second half, two teams that are extraordinarily evenly matched. And it's amazing. You look back at the record for each team against each other, 4-4. Four and four. The home team tended to dominate a little bit as the home team went 6-2 and two in those games. But in the first half of the season, Eau Claire edged out St. Cloud by a half game in order to clinch the first half division title. And then in the second half, Eau Claire cools off a little bit and St. Cloud rises to the top. So these are two teams. You flip a coin right now and just have as good of a chance well, of picking who There's wins. one key point that you said in there that I think is of the utmost importance to that game, and it's that St. Cloud is hosting. You said the home team is 6-2 and two in that series, and with the Rocks hosting at Joe Faber Field, they had a better second half than the Express. Their pitching is outstanding. They also have the bats. You look at Ricky Rodriguez, a couple of guys who can really swing the stick. I think St. Cloud might be the team to pick coming out of the North. And like you said, with how the home team has dominated, everything tilts towards St. Cloud in this matchup. But in playoff baseball, anything can happen. Everything from the regular season, you can't exactly throw it out. But right now, this is playoff baseball, and just one game matters. Now, as we're looking at this from the perspective of the Wisconsin Rapids Raptors, thinking ahead to perhaps who could be the matchup in the World Series should the Raptors win tonight, you've seen Eau Claire four times. You've split 2-2, two to two, a very good ball club that is a very difficult matchup. That would be... Nothing short of an outstanding series. Almost from the very beginning, you'd be certain of that. But we haven't seen St. Cloud at all. We've heard a lot about the Rocks. We've seen a lot of them in the Northwoods League pre- and post-game shows. We've seen them in the stat packs day in and day out. But we haven't seen them on the field. So for the Raptors, there has a little bit of uncertainty going into what might be the World Series. And that might be a reason why uh, Wisconsin Rapids would want to face Eau Claire. A little bit more of a familiar face. You've seen some of the arms before. You've seen some of their bats before. And you might know how to get them out a little bit easier. That being said, going up against a team that you've never seen before cannot present a little bit of a new challenge and a new one that the Raptors might want to rise up to. Well, I think one thing that is of the utmost importance in looking at that matchup of the Wisconsin Rapids, Raptors, and Eau Claire Express is the familiarity because with each meeting... Between hitters and pitchers, it tilts further and further in favor of the hitters. We already know Eau Claire can swing the bat. We know that they have some switch hitters in there that offers them a really unique balance in their lineup. And the Raptors pitching staff hasn't changed much. There aren't many new faces in there, so there's a lot of familiarity, which I think gives Eau Claire a little bit of an advantage. While the Raptors have been good pitching against Eau Claire, you have to wonder if come matchup 5, 6, maybe even 7, 
if all of a sudden the Express start to figure things out and see what some of the teams like Green Bay did, who won their last three games against the Raptors. Once that familiarity is established, a plan of attack can be devised, and all of a sudden maybe this Raptors staff that has been so dominant this season might not be as intimidating. An extremely good point, because once you've seen some of the guys, especially in the back end of the road, in the back end of the rotation as well as the back end of the bullpen, you can kind of figure them out a little bit more. Yeah, in the back end of the rotation, or back end of the bullpen, it's a lot of hard fastballs, 95, 96 from Laxo and Schelling. And not to say that it's easy to hit those pitches, but once you've seen them a little bit more, pick up on guys' release points, it gets a little bit easier to gauge and a little bit easier to hit. Well, this matchup is a moot point if the Raptors lose tonight, so we'll look at their matchup with the Battle Creek Bombers. It's the fourth time these two clubs are going to square off in the last five days. They spent Saturday and Sunday together playing three games, including a doubleheader on Saturday. The Raptors went one and two. It's a series that I don't know how much it really means with respect to this you know, particular ball game. A different situation. Neither team really playing for anything. Both clubs locked into their respective playoff spots. So it was more of an exercise in finishing out the regular season schedule, I think, than actually an example of what to expect tonight. That said... The Raptors will send Eric Ligda to the mound, 1-3, a 2.27 ERA, and the Bombers are sending Nigel Ward, 3-3, three three with a 4.46 ERA. A couple of right-handers, one guy who has seen the Raptors and a guy who has not seen the Bombers. What do you have on tap for this one, Sam? I really like Eric Ligda in this matchup. You mentioned it before we got on air that Eric Ligda has been extremely good against right-handed hitting right-handed hitters, and Battle Creek has had a tough time hitting right-handed pitching. That's a matchup that bodes well for him, as well as the fact that Battle Creek's never seen him. Ligt has got, for a guy who's so big, he only throws about 85-86, but with a very nasty splitter and slider combination that, if you haven't seen it before, it can be extremely tough to hit. And I think that's something that we have evidence of. His first start against the Wisconsin Woodchucks, he went six scoreless innings and struck out seven. His first start against the Lakeshore Chinooks, seven scoreless innings and struck out seven. When the teams are seeing him for the first time, if his splitter is on, on. He's exceedingly difficult to hit. We've seen it. He doesn't throw all that hard. He'll sit in the mid-80s, but with his long stride and his long arms, he cuts down that distance so well and shrinks it to maybe a 55-foot stretch between home plate and the, the pitching rubber. So it comes in faster than 85 or 86. I don't know, though, because this Battle Creek team, as I mentioned earlier in the pregame show, hitting a lot of home runs lately. When Ligda has struggled, he's been giving up home runs, he's been giving up doubles, and this is a team who will swing hard should he leave a splitter up that doesn't have much movement. He can get hit a little bit. And for the Rafters, you got to be able to attack Nigel Ward, because right now the Battle Creek bullpen is a little bit stretched thin. After last night's game against Madison Mallards, they got had to use a lot of guys, so it'll be interesting to see who they have left over for tonight. Well, that's the final matchup that I think is important to look at, and I think it's what tilts things in favor of the Rafters entering the ballgame, the bullpens. The Rafters are largely untouched in their bullpen. Most of their quality arms haven't pitched since Saturday. They had last night off after Chris Cooper, Reed Stumpf, and Alex Varox, as well as Joe Waynehouse combined to finish out the game. It was pretty easy on the core pieces of the bullpen. You're looking at John Jager, you're looking at Garrett Schilling and Blair Laxo. They're all fresh, which means if things go south for Eric Ligda early on, if he maybe doesn't have his best stuff, the Rafters have the option of going to the bullpen in the third, second, maybe even the first inning and feeling comfortable that they can get six, seven, eight innings. And what a luxury that must be for Craig Noto, knowing that even if Ligda does struggle early on, he has an extremely, extremely strong contingency plan. As we alluded to on the other side as well, with Cody Puckett and Scott Sensi both being used last night, there's not as much flexibility for the Battle Creek Bombers. They are still in a situation where it's one and done. There is no tomorrow until there's a tomorrow. So they'll be in a similar place as last night where if things don't go well, they'll try and find something to they'll put the fire out with. Last night it was Scott Sensi, and I think he's probably the biggest reason why they won that game. If he doesn't pitch well out of the bullpen, they have no chance to beat that hot swinging Madison Mallards team. But tonight is a little bit different. They used four arms last night. They aren't particularly deep in the bullpen right now as it sits anyway. If the Raptors can get to Nigel Ward, it could be a long night for the Bombers. And we saw that last night against Lakeshore in a very depleted roster. They got the starting pitcher out of the game before you could record three outs. One, and even though they scored nine against that starting pitcher, once they got to the bullpen, it got even more out of hand after that. Well, we'll see how things turn out tonight. We'll come back in just a moment with first pitch as you're listening on WFHR 1320 AM. The second round of the Northwoods League playoffs. It's the South Division Championship game. The Raptors and the Bombers in just a moment when we return.